explain um, this amazing inventor, writer, and First Nation author. And uh, take it from there. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Blake. I'm an honors student here at the University of Notre Dame in the field of literature. Uh, my dissertation is in Native American literature in the context of the Western literary tradition. But this is a coursework paper that I wrote last semester. And this tracks the similar type of concept, but within Australia. So the coursework papers for honors are 5,000 words, kind of smaller papers. So I chose to experiment with this. Uh, this presentation will engage in a discussion of the terminology used to refer to Indigenous Australians and present the case for a popular adoption of the term First Nation Australian. It will also provide an introduction to the life of David Napon and its parallels with the developments in the Australian literary tradition. And then I'll go into a discussion of the fundamental relationship which exists between the socio-political milieu of Indigenous representation in literature and the social experience of First Nation Australians. Now, the term Australian First Nations refers to the unique and various Indigenous nations in both the modern and pre-colonial era throughout Australia, uh, which remain completely independent from one another. This map provides a brilliant perspective about the type of diversity which I'm discussing. For instance, if we take a study group from the North Arnhem Land, and compare them to, say, a Narin, the Narinjiri tribe just down here, we find a completely different language. And as such, in, in culture and in literature particularly, uh, if there are different languages, uh, they bring with them unique cultural stories, beliefs, and a different understanding of the world. Uh, and these two groups, hypothetical of course, should not be collectively identified as the same people. Hypothetically, I feel it's the equivalent of grouping the English with the French. While both have similarities in language and beliefs, so both socially and spiritually, their cultures remain entirely different. This term eliminates the pan-Aboriginality which seems to have been imposed onto Australian Indigenous people. By pan-Aboriginality I mean spawned from the terra nullius doctrine which classified this land as uninhibited and justified the process of colonisation. This generalisation, I feel, is a remnant of an ancient colonial discourse. The multitude of languages, spiritual beliefs, gods and deities are disregarded in the collectivisation of an entire people. The term First Nation Australian is therefore a term referring to a particular individual whose cultural context, beliefs and customs are not representative of a universal uh, people. David Janai born in 1872 in Point McLean Mission uh, on the banks of Lake Alexandria and of Narangiri ancestry. He died in 1967. Now, I've adopted him as a subject just for this presentation to try and uh, communicate the breadth of my research into a quick 10 minute kind of jab. So, beginning publishing short versions of traditional stories in newspapers such as the Daily Te Telegraph from 1924 to 1959. Inaipon's major work, Native Legends, was completed in 1929 and was an account of Narangiri customs, beliefs, and cultural stories. The two-volume manuscript, consisting of 30 chapters, was appropriated by W. Ramsey Smith for his publication, Myths and Legends of the Australian Aboriginals. Inaipon's prefix and name were both omitted by Smith in the final publication. The omitted prefix, written by Napon, outlined that, and I quote, as a full-blooded member of my race, I think I may claim to be the first, but I hope not the last, to produce an enduring record of our customs, beliefs, and imaginings. Now, when I'm talking about the Australian literary tradition, if we consider literature as the reflection of culture, the Australian literary tradition is therefore a collection of works which best describes the Australian, Australian experience. Using this tradition as a framework, I launched an investigation into the representation of Indigenous Australia within this so-called Australian experience. What I concluded was the existence of three major stages of development. Beginning with what I've called as the period of neglect, uh, in this period, the consideration given to First Nation Australians is shallow and objectified, if given consideration at all. The Indigenous character, as portrayed in the literature of this period, is a representation of an alien culture whose spirituality, myths, 
and the social construct are met with a silent fear by white colonial Australians. There is an apparent lack of authorial research in this period in regards to the representation of First Nation Australians, allowing the formation of romanticised and stereotyped characterisation. This ill-informed representation of First Nation Australian establishes a misguided foundation for the tradition. This then, my shock of confronting the representations of this period, led me to start to question what is informing this representation. During my research, I found the parallels between social discourse, that is the social trends and perceptions of Aboriginal Australians, and the parallels with Indigenous representation in literature. The question which I continued to ask was whether or not social perceptions were influencing literary presentations, or whether the writers of this period of neglect were shaping their literature for the desired readership. This is to suggest that perhaps authors did not understand the complete influence of literature in the social realm. Regarding a presentation as fiction, may have been interpreted, interpreted by readers as factual reflection and subsequently perpetuated the negative stereotype. Coming to this period of enlightenment, we see that Yunaikon's work, although finished in 1929, was not given proper academic recognition until 1970s. Uh, heir to a foundation of shallow objectification, Australian writers of this enlightened period had to fight against a tremendous social inertia concerned with the negative presentation of First Nation Australians. Catherine Susanna Pritchard and her work Coonadoo, published in 1929, Xavier Herbert's Capricornia, published in 1938, and the poetry of Judith Wright will be what I'm discussing in this enlightened movement. Of course, I must clarify that by when I'm referring to these periods, I try to put them down to specific dates. However, in trying to track uh, the development of ideology, it becomes quite impossible to put definitive dates. So by periods, I'm talking about periods of ideological development. Back to Judith Wright's poetry. Uh, throughout, we see a shift from her concern with First Nation metaphysical representation as she becomes concerned with the presentation of human beings um, which existed under a blanket of cultural oppression. On the matter of cultural assimilation, Wright notes, kill us, for we can never accept you, the blacks said. Kill us, or forget your own ambitions. Pritchard, Herbert and Wright present the common themes of appreciation, humanisation, and a more realistic reflection of the urban First Nation Australia. It is because of this that these authors can be defined as pioneers of an enlightened literary movement aimed at shifting generic perception of Indigenous Australia. We arrive, what I've defined or what I've noticed, as a period of self-determination. By this I mean self-determination in the sense that literature, which is forming cultural uh, identity, produced by people of that culture, as opposed to the anthropologically uh, constructed works informed by non-Indigenous Australians. First Nations literature is self-analytical, self-referential, and self-defining in the investigation and in investigating the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous society. These qualities are primarily concerned with the formation of identity by examining the Anglo-imposed cultural norms while promoting a traditional Indigenous spiritual heritage. It was in 2001 that readers were graced with United Bond's Native Legends original text, thanks to the editorial work of two Australian academics, Adam Schumacher and Stephen McKeith. With heavy use of biblical language, United Bond is consistent in arguing against the assumed primitive nature of Indigenous Australia, demonstrating that his people had sophistication in both thought and action that Europeans needed help to comprehend. In closing, Yunaipon was commemorated in 1995 and placed on the $50 note alongside his inventions, uh, the motorised sheep shearer and the quote which I read from before. The sophistication and rationality which this man presents his case is testament to the severity of the mistreatment shown towards First Nation Australians. The representation of First Nation Australians in this country's literary history are weapons and symptoms of a once oppressive relationship between Indigenous people and colonial authorities. The presentation of authentic First Nations characters 
not informed by the pioneering anthropological reports, is a large step towards silencing the literature of the past, which, if not swiftly discredited, may continue to perpetuate ideas of an ancient discourse. As the slide suggests, there are any questions?
the way that they describe the landscape around them, such as the difference between an Arnhem region and the Narajiri region, would be completely different. And that's the tremendous difficulty that I'm trying to balance. I think there's like this tradition of trying to like recently for West white people who try and document Aboriginal people and also Aboriginal people writing in English for themselves is that they try to write how they speak and they try to almost like pigeonize the way yes, that they're speaking. But that in itself can almost be demeaning. Like mm -hmm. it's really interesting. You know, like if I am interviewing someone and I say everything exactly as they said it. I could be seen to be um, maybe, I don't know, making them sound stupid. It's also the difficulty with translating oratio into literature in the sense that I can stand up here, I could give someone my notes and they can present it, but they're not going to present it with the same tone, with the same body language, the same understanding that I have of this material. And it's the same thing when they're told oral stories, they write them down, sure they write them down and you can revisit them, but they still have this loss of enchantment. And words, Aboriginal words have so many different meanings, like deadly. You only need to take ob obvious ones, like, to say for example, deadly, which has a completely different meaning in Aboriginal terms. As if you were a, a Western person who read that, you would have no idea what they were talking about unless you were... And in my studies in this paper, you found that I feel that spelling for Aboriginal terms and Aboriginal regions are just lax. Like people will say Narrangiri, N A R R, -N 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 -N, but the proper is a capital, uh, capital N G, and it's proper. Where that doesn't seem to be very enforced, I find. That's always a difficulty with linguistics, though. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, like in Arabic, which is a phonetic language, whenever it's translated into English, it invariably gets translated. Into so then you end up with families with the same surname spelled completely differently throughout that family when they arrive in an English speaking country. Um, and then, of course, you've got these extra layers, like in Arabic, which uses a lot of um, imagery and symbology in the language itself that we just don't use in English in the same way at all. So there is no translation that you're able to give it in that case. Well, look at Mungard, there's about five different spellings of that one word. Um, you know the invention that um did that did they ever do something with that? Like yeah, it was actually used. Yeah. Um the pattern. Right there. That's it. So a large line would come down and would connect into this, which is a perpetual actuator, and then would move that. So you're talking that. like the, that's, I don't know that the invented that. So no, you're talking about the thing that goes into the sheds and that they pull down on it. Yep, and use, that like one. In that, um, a, a version of that one. It wouldn't be the one they used today, and it probably wouldn't be the one they used today. But look, it, um, in like the 20s and 30s, they would have used it. Yep. It's in, um, what's that picture, that portrait? That is the famous Australian portrait. Uh, yeah. Um, the shearing with God. Yeah. Is it, I think that it's called the shearer. Is it shearer or is it? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, and it's right in front of us. This is what is so fascinating. This uh, man exists, you know, hopefully, more than all of us. And his inventions are there and his, and his quotes are there. But would he, he have had some kind of Western support? Like, Very much so. Very much so. The fact that he was born on a mission um, means that he's born into this umbrella of an already attempt at westernising Aboriginal Australians. Because there's this, under colonial discourse, there's the racialism which assumes superiority, where Westerners are just better. And that was just, no one, well, no one critically questioned it. So, this is where we see justifications for the stolen generations and the terrible, terrible periods of our history. Civilising mission. But, David, I feel I'm on first name terms with this guy. Dave. I He adopted it, but still held on to his traditional Naranjiri spiritual beliefs. And that's what self determinist literature is only just doing now, where we have people like Kim Scott who's writing about the First Nation Australian existence within 
the context of today. Um, still retrospectively sympathetic, but recognising that steps must be taken to move forward. In, back in those days, it would have been um, unusual for him to be encouraged to, to still have his um, relationship with his Aboriginality. One, one tone that I've understood, um, which is very unfortunate and I'm not sure if it's correct, is that uh, I feel that uh, you know, one was perhaps used as a subject in the sense that I feel he was adopted by a particular group of white Westerners and really intensively taught about Western culture, taught about um, things like literature and complex elements which were otherwise not advertised to the rest of the um, indigenous culture. And that's a lot of the sense I was getting from the articles that I had read. I could be wrong, but that's just my interpretation. Do you have any comments this uh, Not in depth. I referenced him in the paper, but it was only in a small section. I feel that being born in 1872, during this period of neglect, and now existing immortalised on our currency, is a good track at where the Australian literary tradition has developed and where it is hopefully going. Or well, it could be called Yeah. Or well, perhaps it's directing the, the, the movement. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. I'm afraid I missed your presentation. I had a while with the class and I can't remember what it was. That's where I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, um, the family, the ancestors of course, he passed away in 1967, uh, year of the 1967 referendum. Um, and there was significant controversy when his family approached the government and said, we didn't give you permission to use his likeness. And then the retort was, well this isn't, it doesn't look like him, they've puffed him up a bit and they've turned him. In. And it was just, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? I think it's actually really, I don't know if you covered that or not. No, no. That was really important because you can look at this stuff and you think, oh, that's respectful. Oh, it's anything but. It's, it's almost like a token. Death. It's almost yeah. like a token. It's almost as if they have presented the $50 note as a testament to the... Uh, look how respectful we are. Yeah. Well, on, but on the other side, it's Edith Cowan. Crazy, but on, what I'm trying to get at is on the other side, is Edith Cowan. So the $50 note is kind of the... I feel is an advertisement for Australia, an advertisement for Australia, saying that hey, we promote uh, equal rights for both racial and gender. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, the fact that he's not recognised for any of his work until the late nineties. Yes, yeah, that's testament enough, I feel, to how he was treated, and that's what where I inform my interpretation of the sense that he was a type of entertainment, in the sense yeah. that he did produce all this work, but no one took him particularly seriously, especially when he completes his manuscript of 30 chapters in two volumes, and this man, W. Randy Smith, scooped it up, took what he wanted, changed, chopped, omitted his name completely, and used it to inform his publication. And he's almost been re... what's the word? Like reinterpreted or reclaimed by white society rather than having been re by his own and, and being put forth as uh, this is, you know, somebody very important within our culture. We've kind of stolen him and appropriate. He's a, he's a cultural appropriation. That's what he is. <laughs> but really, <laughs> if, if we look at it, we're promoting we're promoting Western qualities within Indigenous Australia. We're not promoting Indigenous Australia. The only thing which promotes Indigenous Australia. Can you read this one a bit? I have no idea. Oh, I'm getting pretty good at the cursive handwriting of the archives, but I can't. But that's just that's what I'm saying. Is like <laughs> his attire, his inventions, yes. his writing, everything about him is yeah. painted white. It's yeah. quite a success story, and I say that's what we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Um, I'm just going to thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, coming and to listen to these um, quite astounding presentations, to be honest, um, every 